James, James chapter 4. The purpose of James, again, is to develop spiritual maturity. He wants believers to grow in their faith, become mature. Perfect is the term that's used that really refers to maturity. Um, another point, too, which I kind of never thought about it, kind of obvious, but yet it's not, right? Who are the epistles written to? James is written to who? Church. Twelve tribes dispersed abroad, scattered. The book of Philippians is written to who? Philippians. Believers or unbelievers? Believers. Interesting Colossians to the church of Colossians, right? Why? Why is it written to them? Right? I say Colossians. Colossians. Written to them. Indirectly, the scriptures are for unbelievers. We use them to witness and reach out to them. But the main thrust of it actually is to believers. And people get away from that sometimes when they don't like the passages. We'll see if we get to chapter 5. When they don't like the passage, oh, that's, that's not speaking to believers or about believers. Absolutely not. Okay, when someone does that, they're just wrong. Okay, they need to bend their theology or their viewpoint. Don't twist what the scripture says. It is written to believers. It may discuss people that are unbelievers. But if it doesn't do that, the topic of it is believers. Same thing in Hebrews. This book of Hebrews is written to. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, ah, that's an issue for people. Last time we looked at the source of quarrels and conflicts, James 4, 2, you lust and do not have. I am reading from the NASB. If, um, just the text that I used, Pastor Darrell used it too. You lust and do not have, so you commit murder. You are envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, you do not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Lust, desires, that's what causes conflict, battles, wars, all those things. Desire things you're not getting, so you get upset, and that's why you do it. Solution in that verse 10 is to humble oneself in the Lord's presence. Verse 10, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. And it's, people say, well, the key is humility. You've got to humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. I think the real key there is the presence of the Lord. Are we in the presence of the Lord? Practically speaking, yeah. Yeah, Psalm 139. Where, where are you going to go to get away from the Lord? Nowhere. We're always in the presence of the Lord. If we realize that, that's going to develop in us some kind of humility. Who are you? And who am I? That we're so important. If we were literally in the presence of the Lord, in heaven, we would be down on our knees. Won't be a lot of pride there. And that's what we should live with, that reality, humbling ourselves in the presence of the Lord. Right? So I said, let's put it this way. The tree to grow upwards you must strike its roots downwards, so to be exalted, you must develop a deep kind of humility. So understand that what we do is open before the Lord. Nothing to prove. Nobody to impress. We're not going to impress God. Really? So we try. We barely impress each other, people. We work hard at that. It's not impressive to God. In fact, God uses what? The lower things. The unimportant people at times, right? He's going to go on to another topic now. Oh, I got to tell you this. Who made you lawmaker and judge? Who made you lawmaker and judge? Who made you to be lawmaker and judge? Verse 11. Do not speak against one another, brethren. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother 
speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge of it. That one is going to be a tough passage. First off is, in the world, to, it was all the you know, most popular verses, John 3, 16, and things like that. Well, I don't think so anymore. Maybe it was, or maybe that is for believers. The world loves, do not judge. That's their main creed. Anything you say as a believer, or anything you say contrary to the world, they will come back at you with, you don't judge. By the way, there are hypocrites in the world in the most gross, direct kind. You say anything about what's in this book, and morality, and righteousness, they will hate you. They will judge you. Period. Look at any article on any topic, read the comments, and you'll see judgment. Unending judgment. You won't see any much mercy, love, forgiveness, kindness, nothing. That's the world. Only rarely does it have compassion. I suppose if there's a calamity in somebody's life, a young child loses their life and things like that, I mean, then the world will give some kind of mercy and understanding and compassion. But by and large, if, it's, if you do anything to challenge the world system, they will hate you. They will judge you. They want to get rid of you. I saw people were writing back and forth one time online this place, and, and this real estate agent did the unforgivable thing, right? She put a Bible verse on her website, and something in her email message would have a God bless you in it. And that was like so terrible. Like, how can she be in a commercial real estate setting with a Bible verse? <coughs> right? I looked up and I saw a thing. I saw the kosher connection. You can go online, the kosher connection. I don't know what kind of real estate agent you're going to get through the kosher connection. Mm -hmm. I looked up just to see, just examples of other things. I found the mortgage company, the Sharia compliant mortgages, to get around the Muslim uh, Islam prohibition on interest. And no one was arguing about that being shut down. <laughs> no, just a Christian. Mm -hmm. Just a Christian. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Why? Because things in the world are offensive. But let's come back to the thou shalt not judge. Right? This makes it seem like verse 11. Right? Not to judge. Looks that way, doesn't it? That what he's saying? So we don't judge at all. That's what the Bible teaches. Or this week we do judge. We do or we don't. Never judge. We go through, take a little bit of time. We go through these. The key one is Matthew 7. That's where this comes from. Matthew 7. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. And people stop right there. Matthew 7, 1. But Jesus doesn't stop. He says, for the way... You judge, you will be judged, and by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the law that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, a log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you secretly take the speck out of your brother's eye. That's dealing with the problem of hypocrisy. If you're going to judge somebody, first judge yourself. Remove the sin out of your own life, then you're fit to judge someone else. The reality of it, if we really look closely at our own lives, we're not going to be that likely to judge. It's getting at the problem of hypocrisy. Jesus didn't say, I mean, if he said don't judge, period, and that's the end of it, it would have stopped at verse 1. Two, you know, the following verses wouldn't even be there. He's getting at the part that their judgment was not accurate. Mm -hmm. Luke 6.27 kind of says the same thing, same discussion, but it starts at verse 27, goes all the way down to 45. But he, Luke is recording the same account from Jesus, but it starts off, verse 27, by saying, you love your enemies to good, those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. Show love to who? Your enemies. And he goes on with that. And that you give 
you know, what people need, do not take back. And in verse 31, treat others the way, same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And so forth. And then in verse 36, kind of a, the discussion ends with this, on this part. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Meaning that we replay back good for people that do evil in that. If I think the kids we talk, uh, do not repay evil for evil, but we repay that good. And every once in a while, I hear when the kids say, you know, in the part of the house, God bless you, <laughs> it's a two of each other. <laughs> we knew someone made it itself and said something wrong. God bless you. <laughs> then we go find out what the problem is. <laughs> but they were, it was a good thing, right? They, it was more like you can tell on somebody even better by saying God bless you than coming up complaining and saying all the things that they said. Um, anyway, verse 37, Luke 6, 37, do not judge. Right in that discussion about mercifulness, then this discussion comes in. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. And do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. They will pour over into your lap good measure, press down, shake it together, and running over. Provide a standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. So it does say, do not judge, and do not condemn. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given back to you. Then 39, he also spoke a parable to them, a blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? And so forth. He goes at, and then he goes, verse 42, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck that is in your eye and use something I see wrong that is in your own eye? And then first take the hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you see clearly take the speck that is in your brother's eye. And so forth. Well, it's still getting at the idea of against hypocrisy, showing mercy, pardoning, kindness, love to enemies. It's not a clear statement of no judgment. That's not the point Jesus is making. So the Sermon on the Mount doesn't support that idea. John 17. Now, when I think people say no judgment, I always think of the two things. Matthew 7, John 7. The two sevens always seem to fit. John 7, starting verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, and, let none, and yet none of you carries out the law? Why do you seek to kill me? The crowd answered, You have a demon who seeks to kill you. Jesus answered them, I did one deed, healing a man that was, what? Lame from birth. I did one good deed, and you all marvel. For this reason, Moses has given you circumcision, not because it is from Moses, but from the Father. And on the Sabbath, you circumcise a man. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses will not be broken, are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with a righteous judgment. Same Jesus. Judge with a righteous judgment. They were judging Jesus wrong. Treating him as though he had a demon, believe it or not. Because he healed a man on the Sabbath. Wow. Mm. Didn't say, don't judge me. In fact, for them to listen and appraise and to respond to what Jesus said, they had to have critical thinking and listen to what he said. This judge not thing is an absurdity. What does that mean? I'm not even going to listen to you. Judge not. An avoidance technique. Romans 2, verse 1, therefore you have no excuse, everyone who passes judgment, for that which you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who judge practice the same things. Again, Romans 2, getting at the point of hypocrisy. Verse 3, but do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself that you escape the judgment of God? You point Romans 2, you point your fingers at people that are breaking God's law, but you break it yourself. He didn't say you're wrong to see and understand God's judgment, God's standard of righteousness. It's just that you need to apply it to yourself. And in fact, if you do that, you're going to say, I, I'm guilty. That's the point he's making. 
Romans 14, right? Uh, it says, Romans 14, 14 verse 3, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or fails, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Meaning, don't judge people on matters that are what? That are matters of individual preference or conscience. If someone wants to eat, keep the dietary laws under the Old Testament, fine. If they feel that they're free in Christ to not go along with those laws, that's fine. You don't judge somebody on that. So we're not to judge on something that are non-essentials, unimportant, matters of personal preference. Right? You don't judge somebody because someone likes chocolate ice cream over strawberry or something that's silliness. Right? We don't judge on that basis. We judge the things that matter to God, starting with ourselves. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is a spiritual, who is spiritual, praises all things that he himself is appraised by no one. But who has known the mind of the Lord that we will instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. Right? King James calls it judgment, verse 15. He who is spiritual appraises all things that he's appraised with no man. Meaning we ultimately have to get judged in that sense by God. Mm. Ultimately, you don't answer to me and I don't answer to you. But I must appraise, evaluate, judge. Is this a good use of my time? Is it a good, you know, something that I could recommend? I have to do that with my children. Have to do it in places I work at, deciding what to do, what not to do. There's a judgment that comes with that. Where your money goes. All of these things. Amen. First Corinthians 4 says that. Uh, it says, therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. By the way, too, we see judgment. <laughs> In such a negative sense. Paul says, you know, God's going to come to light, bring out the hidden things in people's hearts, and then each man's praise will come to him from God. He actually sees it in a positive sense for believers. We don't. Isn't that amazing? You know, like Romans 14, 4. For the Lord is able to make them stand. Isn't that wonderful? So Paul doesn't see judgment in that in a, in a negative sense that we do all the time. It's kind of sad. 1 Corinthians 5, 12. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Do not judge those. Um, do you not judge those who are within the church? But those who are outside, God judges. Remove the wicked man from among yourselves. How's that? That's judgment of a church, church discipline of a brother, so-called brother, that was in sin. Or 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Judge yourself. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does that mean a woman has to have her head uncovered? I guess women should be having their head covered up, according to this says. Does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it will dishonor him? But if a woman has long hair, it's glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. Looks like you got to have a head covering if you're a woman, and you got to have shorter hair if you're a man. That's what it sounds like here, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Verse 16 says this, but if one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. This is a custom. It was a first century custom as to how men and women would deal with their hair. A custom is a custom. In a different society, a different time period, there's a different custom. That's why we're not requiring women to do what? Have their hair covered all the time. We're not requiring men to necessarily have short hair. That was a custom then. There would be different customs today. Right? I don't know what the custom be. I can think of some. Okay, that, there, that would be offensive to other believers. We wouldn't be coming into church like that. That's all. Mm -hmm. It was contrary to the custom of that day, and it was disruptive to the church service. And they were to judge that. It was inappropriate. It was not the place to do it. That's it. No more than that. Mm -hmm. 
2 Corinthians 10, 7. You are looking at things as they are outwardly, but if anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ, let him consider this again with himself. Just as he is Christ, so also are we. Meaning we don't judge externally. James 2, we saw a while back, right? Personal favoritism. Someone comes into the assembly with fine clothes. Here, you sit up here. And the poor man, oh, sit over there by a footstool. Right? Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives? Right? Proverbs 31, 9, open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. Supposed to judge. So first, we are to judge. Then first off, we judge ourselves, acknowledge we have sinned and have laws in our own eyes, so to speak. We must turn away from any kind of hypocrisy. We are to forgive, love, and pardon as God has forgiven us. The Lord will judge at a future time when he returns. He will expose the things we do in secret. We see this as a negative. Paul saw it as a positive. Each man's praise will come from God. The Lord ultimately is one who judges, not us. When we do judge, and there are times when we must, we must do so not based on outward appearances. We do it based on what? Scripture. James tells us it must not be based on personal favoritism, wealth, prejudice, those kinds of things. So all of those things, again, putting it in proper context with this idea of judging. We do. And we need, I think, you know, I mean, I think we pretty much one extreme or the other. People judge all the time, or they don't judge at all. Right? Sometimes it's cowardice, sometimes it's not taking a stand for Christ, wanting people to like you. If everybody likes you, you're probably not doing for Christ what you should be doing. Sad to say. Mm -hmm. Everybody speaks well of that person. Famous person that dies. The whole world likes and celebrates them. You read up a little bit more in their life and you find all kinds of compromise and sin. It's sad. That's why the world likes them. Mm -hmm. What did the world think about John the Baptist? Harry, you should be taking your what, brother or wife or something, did he? Mm -hmm. No. James 2 now, verse 11, he's going to talk about part of that judgment, speaking against another brother or sister in Christ. He who speaks against a brother or judges his brother, speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you are judged the law, you're not a doer of law, but a judge of it. Speaking evil against another brother or sister in Christ comes from the same thing, pride. We are ending up exalting up ourselves at someone else's expense. It's the same heart problem that causes the conflict and the fighting. That's another example of it. Again, brethren, if they're brothers and sisters in Christ, why would we speak against them? That makes sense, does it? The truth, the reality is this. You will find faults in other brothers and sisters in Christ. I promise you. I find it in you, you find it in me. Guaranteed. I'm convinced of it completely. If you want to speak against a brother or sister, you can find something. It's there. Right? Just follow them along long enough. You're going to see some things. You know, I think they're really making a mistake with this, and they didn't handle that right. Yeah, of course. Promise. Okay? What are you accomplishing? I'm accomplishing by speaking I really ask myself, is it really? See, Lord, so really say something. A classic one. This goes back like 30 years. This brother was living with a sister. They were not married, living together. This was like about May or something. They had gone on for a month. I realized, you know, should I bring it up in front of the pastor or should I not? I really sought the Lord for a couple of weeks and said, you know, don't do it. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And then they continued to grow in the Lord. By the fall, they got married. And they've been married all that time since. And the brother is really serving the Lord. The point is this. I knew with the growth, I didn't know, but looking back, right? Because the Lord really made the call on that, not me. But that he was really growing in his faith. And so was she. Eventually, they were going to correct that issue, that sin in their lifestyle. So the times you confront and at times you have to what? Back off a little bit. Right? 
if I would have brought it forward, that could have really been a cause to take them away from the church. They're real consistent in church attendance and everything. So it would have been worse. Could have driven them away from the church by coming out of it that way. Yes, every right to do it. That's not what should be done, but there's some times that we don't. There's sometimes I'll take the opposite approach. I thought there were two people over there, but it was they were approved to, to get married and everything, and then I found out they were living together, brought up with the church, under the policy. Really, I, the question was whether the person was saved. I had to deal with salvation before we even get to the point of marriage. That was a bigger issue, salvation. Sometimes you bring it up, sometimes you don't. Um, but that's not to speak evil. It's not. It's done all privately, not to expose someone. That's not the point with it. But so speaks against the law and judges the law. What is the law? James two eight. It says fulfilling the royal law according to Scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. Love your neighbor as yourself condemns evil speaking. Whoever is there to knock someone down, puts down their reputation, their standing among other persons, but puts themselves in the law, making the law, judging what the person did, and finding them guilty. Again, that's not how James looks at it. In James 2.12, he says, So speak and act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What is the law of liberty? Isn't that strange? How can it be a law of liberty? I thought liberty is a law. I thought a law has a judgment aspect with it. Right? No. James is solidly rooted in Jesus' teaching. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Free from what? The law of sin and death. Right? Romans 8, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus sets you free from the law of sin and death. We are under a law, the law of Christ. The law of the spirit. Life in Christ Jesus. The law of sin and death done away with by Jesus on the cross. The city, county, building in Detroit has this. Right? 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We are free from two things. We are free from the penalty of sin, and we are free from the bondage of sin. We're not compelled to sin. That's the kind of freedom that we have in Christ, the liberty that we have in Christ. Galatians 5, 1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. We are free in Christ to come across another brother and knock them down is violating the law of liberty. If they're free in Christ, they're free, aren't they? Again, I'm not saying you can't counsel and advise and talk. I'm not, saying, I'm not going to an extreme with it. But they're free in Christ. Don't we not to set ourselves up as we make the law and we apply it to someone. And whose standard is it? Mine. What's the problem with it? First, my laws are never going to be as good as God's. It's not. It's just not. Second, I don't even know all the facts and circumstances. But we judge at a distance, don't we? Don't need to talk to the person. I already made my decision. No need to talk about it. No need to ask them what happened. And you know full well, time and again, you've gone up and you've talked to somebody and gotten their perspective and you walk away, oh, I'm so, I really misunderstood what happened here. Now that I hear you saying what you said, in fact, you had the complete opposite motivation of what you did. And I totally misread and understood the situation. Right? There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Oh, James, you're so blunt. Who is the one? Only God is above the law. He alone has the right to modify, overrule, make it. Right? Lawgiver, meaning to set in place. He not only authors the law, he judges, administers the law. He's like both the... Legislative branch and the judicial branch. 
Really, all the branches, really. He initiates and declares his law. God is judge. Our inability to do these things shows that we're presuming, we're presumptuous sin trying to be judges. Right? James, this is a rebuke to their attitudes and judgmental actions. Who is able to save? Who is able to destroy? Was it James? Audience, was it? It's not you. Can you save somebody? You can't even save yourself. Can we? How did we do it? How did we get out of the life of sin? Good works? Good efforts? Determination? No, none of those things. James is so blunt, isn't he? Who are you to judge your neighbor? Another one of these rhetorical questions. Mm -hmm. Who are you? See, that's how we talk, isn't it? Who are you to talk about? All right? How rashly arrogant in judging fellow brethren, taking from God, assuming the role and the function of God, like we are the ones who make the standards. Now he's going to give another example of this arrogance. He's going to give an example from the business world. Shocking one. Indirectly, he's going to challenge the whole word faith movement. Verse 13, come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, and engage in business, and make a profit. Verse 14, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Verse 15, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and, do, and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So here's a real boastful statement. I think some people could hear this statement. They go, uh, verse 13, and think there's no problem with that. They say, that's fine. That's how people are today. Tomorrow, today, tomorrow, go to the city, spend a year there, you know, engage in business, make a profit. What's wrong with that? That's just regular business practices. Right? It says, it starts off with go to now, King James. It's a colloquial one only James uses to kind of get your attention. Listen to me. <laughs> Listen to me. Pay attention. Give me your undivided attention. The offender, again, a typical businessman, he says, it says here, boasting of tomorrow. How is he boasting? He's self assertive, confident in the travel plans, confident in the business plans, today or tomorrow. I got a choice of when I go. I may leave for that trip today. I maybe I'll go tomorrow, see you know, what the tickets are, or what my plans are. Such and such a city. Self confident in his time schedule when he gets to the city. Assume the plane's not going to crash. Continue there for a year, spend a year. I control the length of time I stay there. Um, completely self centered, carrying on business, right? As a merchant or trader, there was business back then as there's business now. The problem is what? All and by itself. These whole plans from beginning to end are worldly. There's not one little bit of thought toward God. Is that what God wants a person to do or not? Right? Maybe they have a family. Maybe they have responsibilities. Maybe they're involved in the church. None of those things. The pure direction of motivation is to make a business profit. That's it. And so confident about the time, the location, how much time you spend, and the idea about making a profit. Guaranteed. Right? What's the problem with it? Verse 14. If you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow, you may not even live to be the next day. This is a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. The word faith movement says, you know, your words are containers of faith and when you speak, things come in the past, right? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, like it creates a substance, like God spoke and things were created. We are not little gods. Your words don't make anything. Your words don't destroy anything. Your words are just words. It's what's in your heart behind the words that really matter. In Hebrews 11, faith is the assurance. It's an assurance of things hoped for. Evidence of things not seen. 
That's what real faith is. But the word faith movement is so, I mean, it's just off. It really draws from metaphysics and, and, and pagan kind of philosophies. This idea that well, you can't speak words that are like this, you can't tell, that scared me to death. Well, that could kill you saying that because you put those words in the air. This is, this is crazy. James is completely opposite to this. He says if, verse 15, word faith teachers never use the word if. That's not faith's packed words. Right? That's not how it's done. It's wrong. You do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. First off, you're, none of these things are promised. You're just promised. Right? Men's plans are always what? Tell it that you don't know for sure. You don't know for sure on anything. You don't know for sure your job's going to be there tomorrow. You have no idea. Pastor Bowie did a message one time on it. But, but we have this idea that everything is going to stay the same. We can plan it all out. The reality of it is change is constant all around us. This church will not be the same a week from now. Change will change. Somebody will come in. Somebody may leave. Some program may stop. Some may be started. And that goes through everything. Take your job the last year. If it's any number of people, look at the changes on that job. There's changes all the time. You don't know. You have no idea. Making promises, and you don't know what's going to happen, and you don't, make, you don't keep it. Because you can't control circumstances. I can't control circumstances. Be real careful about making these promises. Man's plans are always tentative. Plans are not his own. Time is not his own. Uh, life is not your own. What is your life? The answer is a myth, a puff. It just, we're here for a short time, vanishes away. What really hurts about this is all the things that you've done and you've built up and you've created, what can happen? It just vanishes away. Five years after we're gone, there may be no trace of any of us were ever here. That hurts. Even if they stick a sign on the building, you don't even know who the person is whose name is on the building. Unless you knew them when they live. Right? It vanishes. Only two things last. God's word and people. Those are the eternal things. Everything else vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. This is so devastating. If it's the Lord's will, you will live. We say it, right? Thank God for waking us up this morning. That's true. That's true. If the Lord wills, we woke up this morning. If it's not, if it's our time to go, we won't wake up in the morning. Starts off with, Lord, thank you for giving me another day. How would you like me to use it? Is a way to do it. If the Lord wills, we will live. And then also do this or that. That's humbling. The way to stay humble is to maintain a godly perspective. Include God in all your dreams and plans and goals. Everything. Include God in everything. This business person in James 4 didn't include God. Those are wasted plans. Consuming them on what? Time and effort and work on money apart from God. What a waste. Loot's not going to last. These are not, again, these are not, real careful, not some charm. Well, if the Lord wills, then I'm going to, I'm going to, if the Lord wills, let's go put it here. If the Lord wills, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, engage in business and make a profit. Did I say that right? No, because that's using it like it's some kind of good luck charm. If the Lord wills. It should be from the heart. Lord, what would you want me to do with my schedule? What do you would like me to do? Not saying it as well, the Lord wills, like I'm really super spiritual. No. Put everything, right? Truly humble ourselves before God. Verse 16. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance, also boasting is evil. Self-centered lifestyle, self-centered living, self-centered speaking is evil. James condemns it. Calls it evil. 
Verse 17, the last verse. Therefore, the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So what's he referring to? Anybody, he says, look, you know full well what's been written here about boasting. Planning and living your life apart from God. Not humbling yourself before God. And you know the right thing to do, and if you don't do it, to him it is sin. This is really a great witnessing verse. It's a great verse, period, because it gets at what? There's sins of commission, things that people commit. Right? I did wrong. I lost my temper. I did, you know, this, the sins that were wrong. These are sins of omission. Things that I know I should be doing and I don't. Right? To him, that is sin. In this immediate context, is saying you living and planning your life, parts of your life, days and weeks in your life, apart from God, is what? Sin. It's wrong to do it. We should live every day, every moment of our life, in the conscious awareness of God and submit everything to Him. Amen. Right? Because what? He's set us free. To do that. James is a blunt fellow. Is he not? Yes. Isn't he? Yes. Hard not to look at this book and see him solidly rooting, rooted in Christ. You know, solidly walking with the Lord. Solidly encouraging others to live that same way. I don't think we would be impressed with James if we saw him the way that he looked. Maybe not with the speech. We would be impressed with the way the man lived. I get the sense this man was totally sold out and devoted to Christ. I really do. I don't think he spent many days living as though God was not there and submitting to God. The royal law, the law of liberty. He's passionate, he's intense, he's serious. He gives such a great example, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. Just enjoy going and hearing what he has to say. So for us, who made you a lawmaker and a judge? The answer to that question is nobody. Nobody. Right? It's like a little kid sometimes. Who are you talking to? Mm -hmm. And the kid says, Nobody, <laughs> right? <laughs> Better not say I'm talking to my mom and dad like that. So who made you and me a lawmaker and judge? Ourselves, which is really nobody, right? My thing is to submit and follow God's word, right? Take the log out of my own eyes. And then I'm fit to judge someone? Maybe not, you know? There will be some judgment, mostly there will be mercy, kindness, and pardon, and love, and all of those things. Even like Paul does, thinking the best about somebody. And the other thing is live every aspect of my life. Everything. Submit your job to Christ. Submit your family to Christ. Submit your car to Christ. Use your car to help you serve the Lord. Give everything up. Give your phone Use your phone for Christ, everything. What honors the Lord who saved us? That's how we are. Right? Not, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Yeah. No, sir. You can't guarantee it. You can't promise it. You don't know. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, first of all, Lord, teach me. You're teaching me these books.